Good morning, NAE. <laughs> uh, like Wanda, <clears throat> uh, I am sin sincerely honored to have been invited to participate in such a historic event. Yesterday, I told Dan that I had approximately 10 minutes of slides, and he said, oh no, you know, no slides. I want to hear personal stories. Uh, so I'm sorry, Dan, I still have slides. <laughs> but I did compromise, so maybe about six minutes of slides and a few minutes of, of uh, personal journey that you asked about. My topic is engineering and medicine, past and future. And this area, the interface of engineering with biology, life sciences, and the impact that is and can have on medicine has been an area that I've been working in uh, since graduate school and indeed is a labor of love. My first substantive exposure to uh, this interface did come as a graduate student at MIT. I went there specifically because of an exciting project that they were working on that promised to deliver, deliver a therapy for a disease for which there was no treatment. The most serious form of brain cancer, glioblastoma multiforme, and the idea was something out of Star Trek. It involves selectively loading boron 10 into the cancer cells, exposing them to neutrons that are slow, for which boron 10 has a high cross-section, becomes 11 fissions. The fission products share the typical high amount of energy characteristic of fissioning nuclei. And the great thing, though, is that the range of these project, uh, products in tissue is so small that this high amount of energy is delivered only to the diameter of the cell. Bottom line is that this had the theoretical potential of delivering very focused radiation damage and death, specifically to cancerous cells and not the healthy surrounding cells. At MIT, I developed a strong friendship with another graduate student. In fact, we became best friends. And the thing that brought us together is that we had the same motivation. We both wanted to use science and engineering to improve the human condition. His area was laser physics, and he was a laser spectroscopist. We shared goals, dreams, and hopes. Uh, quite often, he graduated a year before me, went off to pursue uh, his dreams with Howard Hughes, and one day called me and said, you know, NASA is restarting the astronaut program. I'm going to explore that became an astronaut, flew, and just before his first shuttle mission, called me and told me that he would be the first person to operate the robotic arm. He did that. And on his second mission, he died on the shuttle Challenger. We had spoken many times before that. I visited him many times, and he also visited me in medical school, which I pursued after graduate school. Always encouraging each other to use science and engineering to improve lives, focusing on reducing death, disability, pain, and suffering. This journey that I undertook of working at the interface of biology and engineering was an interface that was accelerating over the, over the ensuing years. We were graduate students in the 70s, uh, and indeed accelerating. And that momentum led to the creation of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Engineering, which I have the pleasure of directing, 
fostered and supported heavily by the Whitaker Foundation. And was, I think, officially recognized, or first recognized to my knowledge, formally in writing by this lead article in Technology Review just after the turn of the century, observing that biology and engineering are beginning to cross paths and the advantages and the impact that this could have, a better understanding and treatment of disease. And indeed, this was underscored just a year earlier by physicians surveyed across the country, asked to rank the relative importance of 30 medical innovations generated over the last 30 years of the 20th century. Rank them, and as you can see, engineering can claim three of the top five and more than half of the top 15 as identified by physicians. Indeed, the top ranked innovation is a consequence of a marvel of engineering, and that is three-dimensional non-invasive imaging of the human body without arm, harm. A quick look at the evolution and history of MRI as an exemplar of this process, I think is both interesting and instructive. Paul Lauterbur and Peter Mansfield shared the Nobel Prize for this achievement. The seminal article introducing the concept that led to MRI is shown in Lauterbur's 73 Nature paper. He had this eureka moment. The phenomenon of nuclear magnetics was, uh, resonance was well known, had not been used for imaging, but he thought if we could vary the magnetic field spatially, this would encode the signal so that a variation in frequency would correspond to location and you can make an image. The concept is shown there, his ability to resolve two small test tubes filled with water. Image is not of a high quality, it's proof of concept for sure. His co-laureate, Peter Mansfield, on the right, first image. This is a note from one of his colleagues who sent me this image. And notice that he says, we always joke that we are not sure whether this is a finger or a rat. But I think it's the former. It doesn't look like either to me. <laughs> and even in retrospect, I have no idea what this was, but I'll take his word for him. He's an honorable scientist. Somewhat of the medical equivalent of the Rorschach test, one might submit. But the point here is there is no limit to imagination. We know this. And as a result of that, there is no limit to innovation. Starting with this concept, poor image quality but promising, and decades of continuous imagination and innovation led us just 30 years down the road to the ability to produce exquisite images of the human brain without harm like the one you see on the left. And on the right, this inflated image demonstrating not only the area in the brain that's involved in listening to music, but the individual notes can be spatially resolved quite specifically as you see there with A, B, C, D, E, and F. Done with MRI. Now, 10 years later, this, hot off the press. Initially featured in Science last year, now the cover story just earlier this year in National Geographic. You may have seen this image from Francis Arnold yesterday, what we refer to as tractography. The pathways, the nervous neural pathways in the brain. The interesting thing that I can explain to you, harder to explain to some of my medical colleagues is that these images of these neural pathways are not directly visualized. They are computed based on the diffusion of water along axonal pathways investigated and quantitatively resolved in 300 isotropic directions. And with this quantitation, based on this high-level tensor diffusion analysis, one is able to 
visualize these neural pathways. The early theory as to the form in which these pathways were constructed was thought to be more like a bowl of spaghetti. Perhaps not quite as intertwined as you see there, but you get the idea. And what Van Wedeen and his colleagues at MGH, who have developed this technology, have demonstrated is something that has rocked the neuroscience community. Observing for the first time, being able to resolve these fiber pathways at close points, as you can see here, a very simple wiring diagram. It is orthogonal and in sheets and layers. And within each layer, these orthogonal pathways. This is somewhat controversial when introduced last year, but their evaluations in animals looking at high resolution, super resolution microscopy images now supports this. And Van has actually hypothesized why Mother Nature has wired the brain with this grid-like pathway. He suggests that it allows easier navigation. It's easier to genetically tell a developing neuron, continue forward for three seconds, then turn left, and develop that way for two seconds. And that this favors plasticity. So that if an area is dysfunctional or you need to relearn a task, it is easier to lay down adjacent pathways to the desired target areas of the brain. And what I'd like to conclude with, Ali, this second to the last slide, is a video produced by my institute that shows you very quickly, only 20 seconds each, six other awesome technologies generated by engineers which are making a difference and promise to make a difference in addressing and improving uh, health. This is set to some snappy music. It goes by so fast that I will assist a little bit with some spotty narration here and there. Oh, oh here we go. OK. <coughs> Now the first segment is an area of regenerative medicine, work that produces a human liver implanted in, in a mouse. It's viable and allows the testing of drugs for potential toxicity without the necessity of having to do this in humans, saving time, money, and lives, as you can see. Biodegradable stents. Stents are part of life. We know that now. They've had a significant impact, but one of the consequences is a high rate of restenosis due to the reactivity induced by the stent. This idea is to dissolve and resorb. The world's smallest MR, handheld, tiny. That's the beginning, but even better news is that it has a chemistry platform on it, which allows you to detect almost any type of target that you'd like, bacteria, viruses, drugs, at a very high sensitivity at the bedside. First, fully functional Doppler ultrasound capable, portable ultrasound that you can put in your pocket, take it anywhere you go, this modern diagnostic tool goes. Rural settings, disaster zones, the most remote regions in the world. Bilayer polymer, with one layer that changes shape as it absorbs moisture and uses water as a source of energy. And this landmark breakthrough highlighted just this spring of epidural spinal stimulation in individuals who are completely paralyzed with no motor function whatsoever 
unable to walk, no bladder bowel function, now returning bladder bowel and sexual function, and some voluntary motion. Quite amazing. And continuing. So I, I would like to end with a bit of wisdom here, as our president did yesterday. <clears throat> with one of our quotes and circling back to space and exploration, this insight from Robert Goddard, which speaks to why we are engineers. It is difficult to say what is impossible. For the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And in fact, I would submit, and I am certain that one of my mentors in the audience here, Bob Nearham, will agree, that it is engineers and engineering that make this statement true. It would not be true without engineers because engineers are in the practice of dreaming, harnessing dreams, and turning those dreams into reality, giving all of us hope for a better and brighter future. Thank you so much.